Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining our weekly podcast. I'm Robin Lewis, founder and CEO of The Robin Report, which, by the way, is much more than a daily report. It is a knowledge platform from which uh, we communicate thought leadership on various strategic topics uh, through, yeah, the daily reports, but also these podcasts, uh, webinars, and hopefully live events in the future. We had a live event. We have what? We had a live event. Oh, that's right. First we did. Live event. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> oh, boy. I, we haven't done it for so long. I guess I forgot it. Anyway, um, along with uh, our chief strategist, who you just heard from, Shelly Cohan, who's also a professor at FIT and Syracuse University. We welcome you to our conversation on the topic of, and this is a fun one, the mall's nine lives. (laughs) Well, uh, Shelley, the cat's nine lives is a fun analogy, but I use it because experts, uh, pundits, consultants, analysts, and even people like you and me have been predicting the death of the malls, or at least two thirds of them, for a very long time, maybe even more than nine times for nine lives. And the pandemic was sure uh, really to wipe a bunch of them out. So even before the internet and smartphones, uh, working moms uh, just did not want to spend the time to drive to and shop through the malls. And that's why, by the way, in the 90s, 1990s, Kohl's stores in neighborhood shopping centers stole roughly $5 billion from rival J.C. Penney, uh, which was anchoring the malls. A brilliant move by Kohl's for sure. And, yeah. you know, when smartphones got into the hands of kids, mainly teenagers, they didn't have to go to the mall and hang out with their friends like I did. I think they called us mall rats. Um, <laughs> but they uh, they just right. use the phone and it's screen and the, it's a preferred gathering place. There's no 20 minute travel to and from anywhere. And in a few seconds, you can log in with your facial recognition now and poof, your friends and you are in a group chat socializing. That's for sure. <clears throat> so uh, a little brief background here, Shelley. Um, The first enclosed mall was launched in uh, 1956 in in Edina, Minnesota, uh, with Dayton's department stores as its anchor. And as rapidly as the suburbs were growing across the country during that period, so too were the malls. So by 1960, get this, there were 4,500 from coast to coast. Wow. Yeah. And... You know, they were like Starbucks, uh, third places to hang out, to socialize, shop, and dine until it wasn't. Um, And the first wave of the beginning of the decline was uh, more women entering the workforce in the 70s and the 90s, uh, through to the 90s. Um, Thus, of course, my Kohl's example. Then, of course, the smartphone, as you mentioned, and that rendered a big blow particularly among, among teenagers, as you said, and the mall hanger-outers, finally, the pandemic was like the third knockout punch, if you will. So today, according to the ICSC, there are 620 super regional malls and 600 regional malls, hmm. totaling 1,220, and those numbers may be on or less or more, depending, but it's around that many. Um, and that, of course, is a huge drop from the 4,500 in 1960. But Shelley, those <clears throat> are only three of the nine lives of the cat, right? And right. now that the pandemic is hopefully somewhat behind us, fingers crossed. So what's the next uh, for the malls? What do they have to do to become even more relevant than they were before the pandemic? Well, we're going to talk about that in a second, what they need to do, but kind of staying with your analogy, there may be an actual fourth looming life out there, the big looming inflation. Oh, good. You're you're right. (laughs) The jury's still out on the impact of inflation 
and how it's going to affect shopping of specifically discretionary spending. And not to go totally off track here, but I have to kind of mention a few things because the numbers are hot off the press. They just came out, but prices are 8.3% higher than a year ago. Yeah. And, and this includes the drop in gas prices that we saw in August. So, you know, when we're looking at the rolling year of prices, here's where people are spending money. Gas, although it's down 11%, right now for the month of August, it's still up 26% for the year. Fuel oil is up, get this, Robin, 68%. Incredible. Just in time for the cold season in many parts of the country. Electricity is up 20%, rents are up almost 7%. So the concern for you know fashion retailers and brands is gonna going into the biggest selling period of holiday. So will shoppers be opening up their pocketbooks to spend on discretionary items? I read in a Bloomberg article that health insurance prices are up 25%. Wow. So consumers are spending more on gas, rent, utilities, food, and health care is their money left for non-essential goods. Not much, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> and here's something that's really interesting about outlet shopping. It's kind of counterintuitive at first glance, but according to Placer AI, Ethan's a good colleague of ours, um, but outlet malls in the beginning of 2022, so beginning of this year, they were down about only 5% in terms of number of shopping visits compared to 2019. So almost, mm -hmm. almost back to normal. Then from March to June, traffic took a nosedive. Visits dropped from 5% to over 15%. So oh. instinctually, I want to say that with rising prices and less discretionary spending, could consumers would be visiting outlet centers at a higher rate. But here's the thing, Robin. I was on the earnings call for Vera Bradley and the CEO who you met, Rob Wallstrom, said that the outlet business for them was down. And here's the reason why. Outlet malls are typically located about 60 to 70 miles outside the trading area of its consumers. Shoppers don't want or can't afford to spend the money on gas to make a 150 mile round trip, you know, Boy. to the outlet center. Or they're just going less often for the same reason. They don't want to spend the money on the gas to get there. So in my opinion, high gas prices is a real inhibitor for non-essential retail. And it's something mm -hmm. that the consumer sees every day. It's a topic that's discussed every day. You got it. Unbelievable. So inflation impacting discretionary spending is bad enough, but also worse is the hammer of crushing interest rates, which could lead to recession. Wow, Robin, I'm usually the Pollyanna around here. I know. I know. <laughs> but just, well, to, just to which... circle back to the pandemic year, when retail literally shut down, most of the enclosed malls had a tough time because most of the tenants were non-essential retailers. So to give you an example, Robin, Simon Properties, which is the largest mall operator by far with 214 million square feet of gross leasable area, dropped 20% of its revenue in 2020. David Simon mentioned in the annual report of 2021 that they actually lost over a billion dollars. Wow. 13,500. 13,500 shopping days in 2020. So you are right, Robin. The pandemic took the life out of malls, first with the initial shutdown in March and then subsequent variants that kept people away from indoor spaces and larger gathering spaces. But here's the good news for malls. Placer AI, Placer AI shows that in July, visits to indoor malls, so just recently, two months ago, and open air lifestyle centers we're only down between three and a half and 3%. These are store shopping visits. So they are lower than they had been in July, slightly 19. So outlet centers really have come back from being down 15% in shopping visits to about 7% for July. So that's good news. And occupancy rates in open air malls specifically are getting closer to the 2019 numbers north of 90%, you know, enclosed malls kind of sit at 85%, which is still down from 2019. Lastly, yep. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> lastly, bankruptcies and store closures are down significantly, 
You remember 2018, 2019, and of course, 2020. So that's very favorable for malls also. Well, I don't, I guess you, it's kind of a backhanded um, <laughs> compliment that they're, they're easing into being down less <laughs> the year before, but they still haven't reached, you know, pre-pandemic um, uh, heights. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not really crystal clear, Shelley, but it's, it's difficult really to wade through and to come up with, you know, any forward looking trends, right? And, and what's causing it. Um, in addition to fewer visitors, um, they're spending less time in the malls, which is probably attributable to one, still kind of a hangover of caution from the pandemic for most consumers, but two, shoppers are doing a lot of research online. And we, you know, we talked about this and written about it. They're, they're doing research online before they go shopping, which is resulting in less time needed uh, to browse in the mall, more purpose-based shopping. And also there are some numbers that say that um, less time in the malls, but they're also uh, buying, you know, bigger baskets. In other words, they're buying more stuff uh, that they've researched before they go there. So anyway, according to Placer, uh, the dwell times in malls has gotten shorter from 60 minutes in 2020 to 62 minutes in 2021 and 2022. Uh, and the medium dwell time is still significantly lower than the 70 minutes median dwell time of the pre-COVID uh, 2018 and 2019 period. So I don't know, Shelley, all the numbers and uh, post-pandemic wobbly recovery, if you will. Um, we know that even before the pandemic, the traditional enclosed regional malls that focused on simply selling stuff, that they were in decline with shoppers not needing to spend the time getting to the mall just to buy stuff. Well, yeah, and, and the enclosed malls really started by turning to sell other categories. So according to the ICSC, retail accounted for about 70% of gross leasable area for malls in 2016. And that has shifted down to just over 60% in 2022. Mm. So, you know, food and non-retail are taking over more of the mall space. And of course, that number is likely to change over the next few years with more developers moving towards this mixed use space. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some of the mall developers did see what was happening and did begin turning their existing malls into experiential and entertaining destinations. And uh, mixed use communities, like you just mentioned, and King above them all was, of course, Rick Caruso's group. And I wrote an article last year titled Car Caruso, Community Creator. I said, localized, mixed use, lifestyle communities are the future. And Caruso is its pioneer. Think an open air neighborhood with gardens, fountains, restaurants, movie theaters, streets and shops, and boutiques of all types residential and commercial real estate and topped off with glamorous, empathetic service. As he says, quote, it's the character that creates the space, unquote. In the Grove, of course, uh, most of the enclosed regional malls can't just tear them down um, and build Caruso-like communities from scratch. So what are they to do, Shelley? Well, you're right. And Caruso was great. We actually did a webinar on that. So if anyone didn't see the webinar from last year on mall and community development, it's a must see. Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Shelley. Yeah. yeah, they just, so I think what um, retail develop, real estate <laughs> developers need to do is just get creative with their thought process. Mm -hmm. So even though they're an enclosed mall, they can still convert their space into mix, mixed use communities. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. But let me also say it's complex when a landlord yeah. or mall operator wants to, quote unquote, convert space to mixed use. That's not easy for sure. 
Some barriers may include anchor tenants that don't allow repurposing or redevelopment of space unless they get something out of it. So keep in mind, Robin, when malls were first came on the retail landscape back in 1956, you know, yeah. it was the leases were a handshake and a smile. Yeah, it was very, very simple and straightforward, right? Super Not very simple. complex. Go but, ahead. Yeah. But today, mall operators give anchors a lot of power and the tenants negotiate back and forth for optimal benefits. These reciprocal easement agreements, referred to REAs, are filled with rules about access, parking, common areas, maintenance, architectural consistency, signage, amendments, terms. These agreements can be hundreds of pages. So when a <laughs> Talk about anchors. <laughs> the malls are anchors to those big department stores. I mean, look at the complexity, complexity here. Unbelievable. Anyway, go ahead. It's true though. So yeah. when a redevelopment project comes along, the anchor tenant may not want to give permission unless yeah. they get something out of it in return. I want more parking, better access. I want a new build out of something. So it takes a long time for these projects to come to fruition. The good news is that malls that want to redevelop is that there's a lot of anchors that actually have already closed stores in some of those malls. So we know Macy's closed some stores, Nordstrom's closed some stores. I think JC Penney closed like 175 uh, stores. Yeah. So there's an example of Stockdale Capital Partners um, from the ICSC, uh, which is a mixed use space in San Diego's Horton Plaza. I know Horton Plaza well. Well, they bought that space for $175 million because they wanted to redevelop it, which quite frankly, it needed to be redeveloped. Horton Plaza needed a refresh. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a 10 blocks of combining office, retail, food, beverage, public parking, theaters. But before they could even get started on the build out, the developer needed to overcome a lawsuit by one of its anchors aimed at stopping the project. So you know how the parties found a solution back in 2019 to get the project rolling? Is the anchor agreed to vacate them all? So that's how the project moved forward. <laughs> And, you know, Caruso talked about this as well in terms of, remember he was telling us how much he personally works with the community? Yeah, yeah. Develop the real estate. These developments his company has built are beautiful reflections of community and customer combined. The water side at Marina Del Rey is a great example yeah. of mixed use space and community. The commons at Calabasas in California. Yep. So, you know, those are some good examples. And then, of course, we, if we're talking about malls, we have to talk about American Dream. Another example. Oh, yeah. Boy, you sure face. do. Go ahead. I know. I well. mean, you know, uh, well, I think you know this, but I'm an official quote unquote tour guide of the mall during the NRF show. But American Dream oh, is. Oh, right. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. I know it really well, but, it, you know, it has a ski slope, a kids' camp, a water park, amusement park. It's got miniature golf, you know, and every single store in there has a unique design specific for that mall. That was one of the agreements when you lease space from there. And of course, there's restaurants, ice skating, Ferris wheel, and plenty, plenty of parking. So it's, I think it's 3.5 million square feet. Wow. I think it generates just under 180 million in revenue. Uh, so in Columbus, there's a space called Gravity which includes 840,000 square feet of space, residential, co-living community, large-scale creative office building, art field experiences, and food and retail within walking distance. So an example of working with the community to build space that is actually relevant to them. Yeah. So, um, you know, Shelly, yeah, I mean, these are great examples. And, uh, uh, the last example is not really a mall, but I can see your point. You know, the word mall may not fit what needs to be done in the future. Mall operators, as we have known them in the past, are now real estate developers, right? Whether it's enclosed space or outdoor lifestyle centers or mixed use space. You're absolutely right, Rob. And I have a fun fact to ask you. Guess <clears throat> what sport is taking up space at malls. It's the hottest rage, this sport. Well, 
I wish it was a golf course so I could play while my wife shopped in the, in the mall. Uh, but I'm guessing based on space, it most likely would not be golf, right? <laughs> yeah, not golf. It's pickleball courts. Oh, come on. Yes, pickleball courts are the latest rage in mall space. So No, it's nuts. Maybe it's because all the boomers are getting older and they can't play tennis, so now they're playing pickleball. I, I wasn't going to say that, but... <laughs> Uh, but and before we end our podcast, I have to ask you this topic because it falls right into this idea of malls nine lives. What's your take on mall operators as retailers? Is it going to work? Is it the oh, fifth boy. life? Malls as retailers? You know, Simon acquired its rival mall competitor, Talmud. Uh, yeah. By 20, it purchased Brooks Brothers, Lucky Brands, out of bankruptcy uh, in a partnership with Spark. S-P-A-R-C, and it also acquired JCPenney to its portfolio of retailers. So, and they did that partnership with a rival mall company, Brookfield Properties. So, and I think it also wanted to bid for Kohl's as well. So can yeah, Simon the, run retail stores? <laughs> well, Shelly, that question is full of nuclear issues. Um, <laughs> As you know, I've written several articles uh, on the Spark strategy. Um, long story short, Simon keeps J.C. Penney and many of authentic brand groups brands from leaving his malls and fills vacant space with other ABG brands. Okay, so the sixty-four thousand dollar question is: Is this a brilliant strategy, or is it a short-term? defensive tactic to keep his occupancy level. However, JCPenney and the ABG brands are arguably slipping into the sunset. Anyway, that said, if that said, <laughs> and the article goes into a lot of detail in this, but if anybody, Shelley, can save the malls, it would be Simon Properties Group because they are the world's largest developer and owner of malls. Uh, 99 malls in the US, according to Statista, as of 2021. And in fact, they have spent billions of dollars over the past several years repurposing towards mixed use properties, more experiential and entertaining destinations. But my closing point, for all of these traditional legacy malls, mixed use lifestyle communities are the future. So accelerate, accelerate, accelerate the investment in repurposing. And with that, amen. <laughs> well, said, well said, Robin. For our listeners, you can find more of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Sprout, and of course, the robinreport.com. Look for us on YouTube where we broadcast our podcast as well. And please follow us on social media, link in with us, follow us on Twitter for the latest thoughts about the industry. And I want to thank our audience, all of you again, for joining us. Uh, I hope you learned some things from our conversation. And as I've said every week, um, if any of you have a topic that you would like Shelly and I to cover, please send me an email. And it's, it's, it's Robin at therobinreport.com. And thanks again.